Hey, this is Cam with Blacktail Studio, and today I'm going to show you how I make my detail mallet. I started off making more traditional mallets, and I noticed how comfortable the thumbhole stock was on certain gun stocks. So that inspired me to try to see if I could come up with something better. And that was my first prototype there, which eventually evolved into this uh, model and eventually into this one here. So today I'm going to take you through the process of how I make that. Enjoy. As I was sitting here recording this, my wife pointed out that she gets asked all the time why her husband makes these funny wood hammers. And they're just for using with chisels. So they're instead of a metal hammer that would damage the wood chisel handle, they are a wood hammer that won't damage it. Anyway, moving on. The uh, wood I'm using here is catalosh. Uh, it's uh, also referred to as Mexican ebony. It is really, really, really hard. You don't have to use a wood this hard. I think that it works better than any other mallet material I've made. I've made them out of walnut, maple, a bunch of different woods. And this is my favorite one. It's not as cool looking as some of those curly and quilted maples and the uh, curly walnut that you've seen back there, but I do think that it works better than any of the others. There's no set size you need for making any type of mallet. I have found that three inches by five inches is a good starting point because then after, by the time you get it cut down, it's just a good roundabout size. So if you're looking for a size, I cut these blanks out to three by five. So what I'm doing here is I'm cutting three pieces the same size, that three inches by five inches, and the middle piece I'm going to end up cutting at a slight angle, and this will be for the handle to fit in in a wedge shape. And I, hopefully this will make a little bit more sense later, but I'm just cutting uh, two pieces the exact same size, and then the third one I'm cutting with a, about an inch and a half gap in the middle, and it'll make a little bit more sense as I go. Once I get the pieces cut to size, uh, I'm using epoxy here instead of a wood glue, and this wood is so dense that it's hard to get a wood glue to penetrate. And you can see there those wedged pieces that I'm on the outer sides there. There's a good shot of them. And that's gonna allow the handle to fit through and wedge in there uh, super tight so it could never come loose. And don't worry about having this exactly precise when you clamp them in there. I, I like to get them really close, but you're gonna cut everything down to size afterwards anyway. So just get them the best you can. And I'm making three mallets at the same time here. So the other two are for a different build that uh, hopefully I'll have a video on later, but here's a good way to clamp up three mallets at once. And uh, remember not to over clamp when you're doing epoxy. You don't wanna squeeze the epoxy out of there. After the epoxy dries overnight, you can cut the end slush and this will give you that perfect end. As far as the handle goes, I tend to go a little overboard. So I ended up actually making a template to route out this kind of cool shape here. Really just a straight piece of wood will work just as well. It just isn't quite as comfortable and doesn't look quite as cool. So don't think that you need to make a fancy handle template like this, just to use a straight piece of wood if you're trying your first mallet out. And you can see there, a couple of the mallets have my logo CNC'd. A friend of mine over at Wood and Other Things uh, CNC'd those in there for me, which was kind of cool of them. And so for this mallet, I decided to fill it with a copper epoxy. If you're wondering why I'm brushing it in instead of just pouring it in, uh, the brush tends to fill all the little micro bubbles. If you just pour it in, you'll get these little air bubbles trapped in there. After the epoxy's dried, I just took it over to my oscillating belt sander to clean it up. When you are putting something like this on a belt sander, make sure you're not getting it too hot. The epoxy can kind of melt, which uh, compromises it. So just go nice and slow, cleaning it off here uh, with a little uh, belt sanding cleaning rubber thing. I think that's the technical name for it. Anyway, just go nice and slow until you get it where you want it. One side of the mallet is going to have a squared off face at a slight angle like this. Uh, the other side I'm going to take over to the bandsaw and I'm going to rough it out uh, and just a slight rounded shape, and I don't actually draw this on there. I just kind of eyeball it, and then I'll get it down on the belt sander and try to get it a little bit more consistent shape, a little more consistent arc across there. Over at my other belt sander, just go nice and slow and keep going, trying to get a nice consistent arc all the way across. Once it looks like it's uh, pretty good, move on to the next step. For no particular reason, I'm doing a 45 degree chamfer on all the edges. I'm gonna do this on the handle and then I'm gonna also do it on the mallet head itself. And this is just for looks. So a lot of them all do roundovers, but for this one, I decided to do the chamfer bit. Anytime you're freehand routing, just try to be as careful as you can. I'm not the biggest proponent of safety and I probably should be, but uh, just uh, this is one time I will always wear my eyeglasses. I should wear them more often, but the router does kind of scare me a little bit. 
how we're going to cut the slots uh, for the wedges in our handle is I put my miter gauge here and I just clamped a piece of plywood to it. Then I clamped the handle to that, took it over to my table saw, marked a couple lines, and that is going to provide the slots for our wedges. It's always a good idea when you're making one of these mallets to do a test fit like this. I've done a few of these that I didn't do a test fit and it was too tight and ended up cracking the mallet head by the time I stuffed the handle and the wedges in there. So do a test fit like this, make sure it's all set. And this is one of the best tips I can offer you is putting this packing tape down. I like it a little better than painter's tape because it will repel all the glue, whereas the painter's tape will absorb some of it. And if you spend a little bit extra time here, you'll save yourself a ton of time and get a much better finished product than if you end up chiseling and scraping off the excess glue. And I say glue, but I'm actually using epoxy again here. Uh, no particular reason. I think the epoxy will fill in those uh, little micro gaps in this head a little bit better and you see how smooth it goes on there with the epoxy just dab a little bit more in there and then slide the wedges in and i just tap them down really lightly with a rubber mallet you don't want to pound them too hard and you'll see here you want to make them go in evenly so you have a nice even uh color gap so it doesn't look like one side went in deeper than the other and that's it once the epoxy is cured, I'm using a Japanese flush cut saw, and I actually don't go all the way down because the flush cut saw will still leave a little bit of scratches on there. I just get it close, and then I'm going to take it back over to the belt sander, smooth it out. And if you're wondering why I have two mediocre belt sanders instead of one really good one, I don't have a good answer for that. Uh, I've had one for quite a while, and then I recently got the oscillating one, which it works fine. It's just pretty underpowered. The Porter Cable one has quite a bit more power, so that's why I still use them both. Okay, now's the fun part. Now there's a lot of mallet videos out there and everything I've shown you up to this point isn't really anything unique, but this is a design that at least I think I made up. I haven't seen anybody else do it before. And that's all I do to start is just trace my thumb and I'm gonna go nice and slow. And it's not because I have a choice, it's just because this power carving takes a really, really long time. Set up kind of a makeshift dust collection so uh, I don't have to breathe in this catalog, which is actually really harsh on your nose. Kind of uh, feels like chili pepper when you breathe it in. And all I'm using is my air-powered die grinder and a saber tooth sanding sphere. They make a bunch of different uh, shapes. I like, uh, this is the coarse grit one. I'm going to switch to the fine grit in a little bit. But I just kind of start hogging it out. And then as I get a little bit further, I'll start test fitting and taking a little bit off here and there. And it's kind of a slow process, but it is kind of a fun, satisfying process at the same time. Sometimes it's cool to make uh, mallets out of different colored wood, so the center piece is a different colored wood. And if you do that, you want to be really careful not to carve too deep. I, I've done that before too. So this one wasn't as much of an issue, but I still didn't want to carve into that center section. So I was doing some depth measurements as I was going. But other than that, you kind of carve it out for looks, then carve it out for comfort or the other way around. So from the time I started to the time I finished, it was probably 30 minutes to an hour of actual carving and sanding in there. Uh, so it's fairly time consuming, but it is kind of a fun process to see it come to shape. The last thing I did was move over to my Dremel to take out the last little bit of scratches that were left. I've gotten in the habit of putting one of these copper rings in all the mallet handles I make, and it's really just for convenience. But I do think they ended up looking kind of cool too. So for this one, I'm doing a 7 8 inch uh, copper ring. It's just from Copper Pipe I got from Home Depot. When you're drilling these, you do want to clamp them down to a, a sacrificial board underneath, and this will prevent you from blowing out one side, which I'm sure we've all done at one time or another on the drill press. It's a really simple process, but it gives a nice finished look to your product, and only costs a couple bucks, takes a couple extra minutes. And you can tell I'm a woodworker that tries to do metalworking based on the quality of my metalworking tools compared to my woodworking tools. I have an old Craftsman vise and some woodworking squares, and you'll see that my vise isn't even bolted down very well, and I have an old blade that's probably seven years old, but it gets the job done. Kind of embarrassing, though. This copper pipe is just some copper plumbing pipe I got at Home Depot. I think it was like eight bucks for five feet of it or 10 bucks for eight feet of it. And I'm just using a little bit of CA glue or super glue. Doesn't really need it because it's such a tight fit in there. But I add a little bit in there, tap it in, make sure it goes in straight so you don't blow out one side when you're hammering it through. And then just grind down the ends till it's flush. Just make sure you don't go too fast and get it too hot because you can melt that glue that we just added in there. 
I don't know if anybody watching also watched my sanding a slab up to 12,000 grit, and I definitely wasn't planning on going that high with this mallet, but as I got into it, it just seemed like uh, the right thing to do, so I took it all the way up to 12,000 grit. And if you've never put your sander in a vise, then you aren't living. I did not invent it, but man, it makes sanding stuff like this so easy. Uh, I should mention the handle I only took up to 400 grit, but the head of it I took all the way up to the 12,000 grit. The hardest thing was getting in that thumb slot, though, for especially when I got up to the high grits. This took I don't even know how long. Started with 1,800 grit there. And I'll show you each step so you can see how the sheen changes of this mallet. But it took a while, but in the end, it looked really cool. You can see there the sheen starts to step up pretty quick. Uh, you don't really get the dust collection with this micro mesh abrasives. And I guess I haven't mentioned yet that these are micro mesh. It's not a traditional sandpaper. They're a soft padded uh, abrasive disc that are really specialized, but they sand the wood quite well and not going to find anything uh, even close to 12,000 grit in traditional sandpaper. Feel free to fast forward at this point if you're tired of watching me sanding. Sanding is about like watching grass grow. I just wanted to include all of the different uh, grits here so you can see how it changes from going from 1800 to 2400 4000 6000 8000 all the way up to 12000 because you may want to stop it you know a lower grit but i wanted to show you the difference in sheen you get on this wood it's more like a polished marble than a traditional wood finish but it's a really cool really unique look you can use these abrasives on a lot of different woods, but it works best on these incredibly dense ones if you had like an olive wood or even a pecan, Osage orange, ebony for sure uh, would polish up really nice. Anything over maybe 2,000 on the Jenka scale will get you that nice sheen. And this one I think is about 3,600, so just a cool look. Like I said, more of a, a polished stone like a granite or a marble than a wood by the time you get it all the way up. I was liking the look of it so much by the time I got it all the way up, I think this is 8,000 and on to the 12,000 that I was tempted not to even add a finish. And I am glad I added a finish in the end because I think it did help the look, but something really cool about that natural sheen there. And a lot of you woodworkers out there are probably saying that you can't even add a finish to something that's sanded so high. And that is true of something like a lacquer or polyurethane. You shouldn't sand this high and then add that to it because it would kind of defeat the purpose and it wouldn't bond that well. But this is Odie's oil I'm using, and it bonds to wood at any grit. So it's a different type of finish. You'll see this similar thing with a, like an oil finish or some old-timey gunstock makers that they'll sand it up really high. So it is acceptable to sand this high and add a finish. You'll also notice that I'm not wearing gloves, and sometimes I wear gloves with Odie's oil just to kind of keep the grease off me, but it's a food-safe finish. Uh, so it won't hurt you. It's even supposed to be good for your skin. So... Put it on and then just wipe it off. Just make sure you get all of it off because that makes all the difference. And here it is about two months later, intermittent use. Lost some of the sheen from the initial buffing, but overall I think it looks really nice. The real question is how does it work though? And it may not be for you. I really like it, especially at funny angles like this. I was putting a bow tie into the end grain. Um, I got a lot of comments when I first made these saying that I was going to break my thumb and I think that must be from blacksmiths or metal workers because you just want to barely tap that chisel. You don't want to put a lot of force into it. So if you're hurting your thumb, don't use it. You definitely don't want to be forging uh, irons with this, just, just tapping a chisel. I will say that it is really comfortable for angles like this. Uh, I don't find it as comfortable for straight up and down chisel work like this here. You can see my wrist is just a little bit of an uncomfortable angle, so I wouldn't be opposed to just using a regular mallet for this. But for especially that gouge work, if you're you know, doing a low angle kind of texturing, I think it'd be really nice for a gouge or the odd angles. The Catalosh probably isn't the prettiest wood that I've ever worked with, but it is probably my favorite wood for mallets. Uh, I would love to hear from you guys. I'm sure some of you out there have made some mallets. Maybe you guys down south, uh, Osage Orange, or any, any unique woods out there. I'd love to hear your input on what you think the best wood for a mallet would be. And if you enjoyed this video, please subscribe for more just like it. Thanks so much.